our study of his holy word tonight. Father, we give you praise that in the middle of a week we can come uh, away from the rat race of life in a fallen world with all the, the busyness of work and family and uh, engagement with our society. We pray that you would uh, bless our time together, uh, orient our affections, help us to set our minds on things above rather than things on the earth. And would you hear our prayers during prayer meeting tonight and answer them according to your good and perfect will. And as we open your inspired and inerrant word tonight, would you change us, transform us, help us through the aid of your spirit to put into practice these truths for the praise and glory of our Savior, the Lord Jesus, in whose name we ask it. Amen. All right, tonight we want to continue a study we began last week. Discipline, a tool of godliness. This will be part two. Uh, synonymous terminology we could use is self-control, which is a missed Christian virtue. We understand that there is no instant godliness when we come to Christ, but lots of work as we work out our salvation and obedience to Philippians 2.12. We settled the the opposition people raise about discipline and calling it legalism. We, we dealt with that last week. We're talking about grace-motivated effort. This is out of love for Christ, for the glory of God, and that's why we exercise self-control, which is a Christian virtue that is often neglected. Dr. J. Adams, in his booklet, Godliness Through Discipline, uh, was rehearsing a counseling episode he'd had years ago, and he gets into all the, uh, uh, how he'd learned to, to yo-yo. And anybody still uh, use a yo-yo? Or you all know how, right? Um, well, he had this guy come in that was about eight years older than him. Uh, he was 50 years old, and he asked Dr. Adams, how can a 50-year-old man change? You know, somebody that's set in their ways for five decades. Can this really be for you? Can you really be different? Can you at this late date in life make a change and start to live a life that really will be godly? Positively. Counselee. I continued. When I was 10 years old, I learned how to yo-yo, and now many years later, I was able to just pick up a yo-yo and find that the old skills were still with me. The question is not whether a 50-year-old man can change. The real question is, can anybody change once he has learned something? When I was 10 years old, I learned a skill that I haven't forgotten, even though I haven't used a yo-yo since. Ridden a bike for years, yet you know you could do, you could do so. Probably wouldn't take you five minutes to get, get in the groove again. It would come right back to you. The question then is not whether a 50-year-old man can learn. The question is, can anyone, even a, a nine-year-old, once he has learned a wrong practice, when that practice has become so much a part of that child that it lasts uh, without reinforcement for over 30 years, can he change? And the answer is yes, by the grace of God, he can change too. We've, we're in 1 Timothy 4, 7 and 8 last week. We looked at the command to not... Give ourselves, waste time in womanish myths, but we're commanded to discipline ourselves, to exercise self unto godliness. We looked at the command, the results, and the benefit. And then in the next verse where Paul says to Timothy, for uh, bodily exercise profits little, but godliness profits us for both this life and the life to come. We want to exercise the inner man out of obedience to the Lord because we live in this gimme culture, do we not? Craving is in vogue. I hope none of you eat honeycomb cereal. But their mascot is called Craver. Sprite's line is obey your thirst. White Castle's model is what you crave, because the crave is a powerful thing. The message to our young people is simple. You need it, you want it, 
you won't be happy unless you have it. See, the world sells things by trying to get people to lose control of their impulses, whereas God's kingdom call for followers of Christ is to discipline yourself for the purpose of godliness, 1 Timothy 4, 7, and 8. And yet so often, godly principles of exercise and discipline unto godliness has been replaced with feeling and desire. While biblical character building depends on self-restraint, much focus today is on emotional fulfillment. The wise man Solomon, moved by the Spirit, exclaimed in Proverbs 25, 28, a man without self-control is like a city broken into and left without walls. So strap on your first century sandals and get into what Solomon is talking about there. In those times, the city's walls were its chief means of defense. If breached, an invading army could pour into the city and conquer it. Thus, a person without self epitome. He's the poster child himself. Having 700 wives and 300 concubines, he disregarded his own words of wisdom and let his passions run out of control. So God divided his kingdom in the days of his son Rehoboam, and the Davidic dynasty was crippled from that time forward. So let's get back into the, the biblical emphasis here. Let's advance our slide in our minds to the biblical emphasis. There we go. In addition to Proverbs, Paul lists self-control as an expression, a demonstration of the fruit of the Spirit. Go run over to Galatians 5 with me if you would. Galatians chapter 5. We're well familiar with the contrast that takes place in Galatians 5 between the works of the flesh and the fruit of the Spirit. Galatians 5.22, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness. Verse 23, gentleness, and notice the end of the sentence, self-control. Against such, there is no law. That term, self-control, eg krateia, refers to restraining passions and appetites, especially the more sensual passions. Think of the mass amount of sexual sin issues that are a raging fire flowing out of an uncontrolled life, where you just run by your own lust, your where there were a lot of small sellouts, not restrained safeguards in place to keep you from indulging the flesh. Though not referenced here uh, on your slide, let's turn from Galatians 5 back to 1 Corinthians 9 for just a moment for a couple of more verses. In a similar manner, Paul writes to the Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 9, 1 Corinthians 9, notice verses 24 and 25, if you would. He asks a great question, a penetrating question, a convicting question. 1 Corinthians 9, 24, do you not know that those who run in a race all run, but only one receives the prize? The win. Now everyone who competes in the games exercises self-control in all things, They do it to receive a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible. They do it to receive a corruptible crown. You had mentioned last week uh, as I was coming into Bible study, um, I think I was driving our Elantra, and it's the newest vehicle we've ever owned since we pay cash for what we've got. And uh, I don't like all the horns and whistles, but it's got this thing, this eco setting. And you put it in eco mode, and it limits, uh, we've got a spongy place in the pedal. It's like, I, when I'm getting on the freeway, I want to get up and go. But by putting it in eco, it limits the output to conserve on gas. I remember when I was a little tyke and started driving my grandfather's tractor.
resist limits to its freedom. I can, so I'm going to, and I You know, we, we may not like to put regimented items in the calendar because once it gets in the calendar, then we've got to do it. Schedule. Like the walk at 10 o'clock. On the books, there's not a whole lot of flex and you can't fly by the seat of your pants as you discipline yourself to develop a plan and then work your plan. Yet, also, we're more, there's more productivity towards godliness, which we won't get without it. You know, the flesh says, I can do this. There's no law saying I can't. Quote me chapter and verse on why I can't indulge in this, that, or the other thing. But when we give the flesh an inch, what's it do? It takes a mile. Paul says that just because something is lawful doesn't mean it's beneficial. We didn't look at verse 23, where he says, all things are not all things are profitable. All things are lawful, but not all things build up. You know, we do whatever it takes for the sake of the gospel. Nothing short of winning would do for the race and for the believers. I, I read from the wrong chapter. That was chapter 10. Go back to verse 23 of chapter 9, where we just snapped verses 24 and 25. He says, I do all things for the sake of the gospel so that I might become a fellow paytaker in it. And then he illustrates gospel living with a race. Lots of people are running. How many people get the award? One wins. Nothing short of winning would do for the race. And for the believer, winning is the glory of God and the godliness of our lives. You know, the Greeks enjoyed two great athletic events, the Olympic Games and the Isthmian Games. And because the Isthmian events were held in Corinth, as Paul addressed the saints there, they were quite familiar with this an analogy of running the race. Lots of people compete, only one gets the prize. Paul also includes self-control's lack in a list of vices characteristic of the last days in 2 Timothy 3.3. 3. What's carnal man like? There's no control. You know, several times in ministry on Crete, Titus is exhorted to teach self-control. Go over to Titus, if you would. Titus 2 Verse 2 is Titus's mandate, or, or what he's instructing the, uh, the saints on Crete. Titus 2, 2, older women, are, or older men are to be temperate, dignified, sensible, sound in faith, and love, and perseverance. Verse 5, women are instructing other women to be sensible, pure, workers at home, kind, being subject to their own husbands so that the word of God will not be slandered. Verse number six, likewise, urge the younger men to be sensible or self-controlled. Lest you think that Solomon and Paul would be the only ones that teach the need for us to exercise self-control. How about Peter? Several times in uh, both First and Second Peter. First Peter one and verse number thirteen. Therefore, having girded your minds for action. Being sober in spirit, fix your hope completely on the grace to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Spiritual sober-mindedness includes the idea of being steadfast, self-control, having a clarity of mind, and moral decisiveness. Over in his second epistle, second Peter, 
1, 5. Now, for this very reason also, applying all diligence in your faith, supply moral excellence in your moral excellence knowledge. It's literally holding yourself back. He, where, where, notice how that uh, where another in your moral excellence, the end of verse 5, you're adding knowledge. Verse 6, in your knowledge, you're also adding self-control. And then to your self-control, you're adding perseverance to perseverance, godliness. It's used again of athlete who were to be selfish and self-disciplined. You know, one of my boys who is uh, lifting and bodybuilding, I never know when he's bulking or cutting. You know, got it. Uh, can't eat enough or restrain enough. Christians must control the flesh, must control our passions, bodily desires, rather than being controlled by them. We need to discipline our desires, make those desires the servant and not the master of life. You see, there's a lot of Christian sloth in this area. Self-control receives very little conscious attention and pursuit from many, maybe most Christians. Certain things in our Christian culture tend to restrain us from obvious sins, but within those boundaries, we pretty much do whatever we want. You know, the, there's a toleration of this, what we might call a respectable sin that opens the door to others. Say you're lacking control of your tongue. It opens the door for much defiling speech, whether sarcasm, gossip, slander, or ridicule. I use that phrase, respectable sins, because years ago, Jerry Bridges wrote a really helpful Christian discipleship book entitled, Respectable Sins. When's the last time you heard a lesson on discipline, or on gluttony, or laziness? See, they're accepted in the Christian culture. Chapter 13 of his book deals with this topic of self-control or discipline. So I guess maybe we ought to continue to define it. It is governance or prudent control of one's desires, cravings, impulses, emotions, and passions. Or as I'd earlier mentioned in the introduction of the lesson tonight, it's grace-motivated effort. We're going to do whatever it takes to win, whatever it takes to glorify Jesus, whatever it takes to grow in sanctification. We're going to put those restraints in place. It's a moderation in legitimate desires and activities and absolute restraint in areas that are clearly sinful. That would mean... Moderation in watching television and absolute restraint in viewing internet pornography. One is a clear-cut prohibition in Scripture, and the other is kind of willy-nilly. Is it right? Is it wrong? Well, this is something that we could even apply to our smartphones or social media. You know, I'd love to have you read Mark Shaw's little booklet. He, uh, since Mark Shaw is a biblical counselor and he deals with what we call addictions, and he's got a little booklet on gaming and TV and things that end up becoming idols in our lives. Is it sinful to watch TV? No. But it becomes so when you haven't spent any time with the Lord. How about the time we fritter away on social media? It's not wrong in moderation. But when we run out of time to fix the dinner or do the laundry or other responsibilities that we have to do in a home, it becomes wrong. And the tool that we utilize is this discipline, self-control. You know, this should be along the lines of what Paul spoke of in 1 Corinthians 6.12. 
All things are lawful for me, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. You know, cravings, when they are ruling the roost, we've got a problem. He'll uh, go on in the next verses to talk of the connectiveness of body and spirit. So that, say, sex isn't just a biological act. When in bed with a harlot, you're joined with her in rebellion against God, pursuing the idol of a sinful heart. Everything a believer does is sacred. Encounter, it's a spiritual act. That's what Paul wants us to see. We've we got to see this with spiritual eyes of faith. Everything's sacred. There's no dichotomy between the sacred and the secular for the believer. It's spirit, a spiritual service of worship. Our body, according to 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20, is the temple of the Holy Spirit. Our souls reside in this body of flesh. How are you treating the body? We'd already visited in chapter 9, verses 26 and 27, about running and fighting, being temperate, discipline our body. That was slide two. What motivates us to do that? Why do we discipline ourselves? This grace-motivated effort. Paul says to the saints at Corinth in 1 Corinthians 10, 31, did any, any of you memorize that? Whether you're eating or you are drinking, do all to the glory of God. The glory of God is what motivates it. So self-control isn't an act of our own natural willpower. Biblical self-control covers every area of life and requires unceasing conflict with the passions of the flesh that wage war with our souls. This, battle on. You get up in the morning, let's have at it. Humble submission to the influence and enablement of the Spirit of God. And yet, since the Spirit is silent without the Word of God, uh, we understand our need to get in the Word. You know, there's many areas of life that we could kind of tease out this biblical principle, this virtue of being self-controlled. Whether it be time, or money, or temper, or eating and drinking... Let's, let's elaborate on the latter. We have a tendency to give ourselves to desires for certain food and drink. Think of the committed Christian who consumes 12 cans of soda every day. Jerry Bridges in Respectable Sins uh, recalls a day that his own cravings for ice cream. When he'd have a dish at dinner and another dish before bed. And he realized, you know what? This is not living a controlled life to the spirit. I got to take care of this body. Think how a seemingly benign practice greatly weakens your self-control in another and possibly more critical area. We need to learn that we can't pick and choose areas of life that will exercise self-control. You know, I'll be, I'll be disciplined in this area, and it won't affect the other area. What's the theological word for that? Bull. <laughs> Ain't going to happen. Any areas will gain mastery and spill over to other areas. Foundationally, we need to remove or Get away from whatever tempts us to indulge in our desires. Uh, since I mentioned Jerry's uh, self-confessed problem with his ice cream, this, the, at least two bowls a night, he had his wife help him in his sanctification and stop stocking the ice cream and only buy for special occasions because you've got to staff for your weakness. If you've got the hungries at night, where are you going to go? You know, the pantry or, or the freezer in this case. Was it sinful or wrong? No, not initially. But it did become so as it developed into a craving. You see, we end up developing a craving just like Israel did and need to get sober because while we tend towards being passion-driven, growth in godliness demands that we grow in being principle-driven, directed by the Spirit in the Word. You know, 
our tendency is to indulge our desires so that they control us rather than us controlling those desires. I think I'd mentioned last week, you know, Paul talks about his own testimony, how that I buffet my body and make it my slave, lest when I preach to others I become a castaway. And we would rather buffet our bodies. Give it whatever it wants. If it feels good, do it. Why should I restrain self? So we said that we, would, that we could illustrate finances or temper or time, but we, um, you know, when I was really starting to think through the need for Christians to exercise self-control was in the midst of me, I, I'd almost died after six years, mainstream medicine trying to figure out what was going on, Houston, we have a problem, and I had to radically overhaul my physical life and what I was ingesting. You know, some assorted aphorisms here in the next slide. Um, you know, I was told if you don't make time to stay well, you'll be forced to take the time to be sick. You see, in our fast-paced convenience age, we've learned to fritter time away rather than steward and master our minutes. You know, I can't believe how much time I spend these days cooking now that we're away from processed and boxed and processed food. You see, people make time for what's important. And now that I'm out of the daily pain and I'm off the floor functioning again, uh, it's, it's not worth it. You know, I think about that and the cheating. Are we living to eat or are we eating to live? We're so tied to textures and taste and we've, we've trained our palates that we, we need certain things like sugar and high fructose, like all that stuff that used to go in my coffee in the morning. All the tasty stuff. So why prohibit it? We enjoy it. Well, if we train our thinking so that we look at food as medicine, something the body needs. I remember popping blueberries in my mouth uh, as I was starting to eat right stuff, and I'd post it on social media, I'm taking my medicine. You know, every meal of every day contributing to how I was able to function. Had to be regimented to eat every three to three and a half hours, so as my alarm went off before Bible study tonight to remind me to change the water out here, I had to have an alarm go off while I'm studying to, oh, I need my snack to keep the blood sugars uh, at the, the right place, not waiting for the hunger pains or the low blood sugar. You know, your answer to this question can even expose some hidden idols. Just because you can doesn't mean you should. If we're really concerned about stewardship of the body, the temple of the Holy Spirit, how are we controlling it so that we get it to where it needs to be? You know, the fact, when it comes to things like health, there are witch doctors, I think, on both sides, whether it be mainstream medicine or alternative care. I don't want to be negative, but honestly evaluate and assess. You know, we... It's easier to pop a pill that's prescribed than to overhaul your life and eat yourself better. I was looking at the time at our family of nine, seven kids, two adults, and an extreme grocery budget as it was before we changed and started buying more expensive food, grass-fed, organic, free-range. Again, it's easy to go to our doctor and get a prescription for a pill you know, in their bag of tricks, what, what can medical doctors do? We can, we can drug you, we can cut you. That's uh, what our tool pouch helps us do. Which many times will help with symptoms, but no idea the negative effects. And as I would mentioned earlier, in regards to Paul buffeting his body, our society would rather buffet it. You know, if health's going to decline... Let it not be to our, due to our laziness or unwillingness to overhaul life, whether it be spiritually or physically or both, to turn over every attempt at improvement. What goes in the physical world illustrates in the spiritual. That's why Paul gives us an inspired metaphor that we looked at last week. 
bodily exercise does profit, it profits little in contrast to exercising to godliness. You know, as I was thinking through just the, the physical aspect of these bodies and how we need a little more restraint, 12th century Egyptian physician Moses Myamides, who prescribed broth for colds and asthma, was known for saying, no disease that can be treated by diet should be treated with any other means, unquote. Your broth is also used in Chinese medicine, Jewish tradition, African heritage. You know, as some of our saints were serving other saints that were sick not too long ago this summer, and soup delivered, what's that soup dubbed as? Jewish penicillin. You know, I don't necessarily relish my daily routine of having to warm up bone broth every morning, nor take time to cook and to jar and to, to freeze it, but I was forced to. There's no other option. Friends, some friends would come from the congregation and say, you know, Pastor, you're so disciplined. I had to honestly reply, I'm just as lazy as anyone else. It's a lot of work. Whether in the spiritual realm or the physical realm, to discipline ourselves for the purpose of godliness. You know, the, the probability is that the younger generation is going to live shorter and probably less quality. It's just getting worse and worse. We, yes, need to exercise some discernment, knowing that there's deception, propaganda, there's agendas, a lot of money to be had. I think it's a misnomer when we say in regards to physical discipline and how we eat for maximum health, but we say, I, I can't afford to eat healthier. I remember, uh, some of you probably remember too, in, in college, living on ramen and whatever else you could get for 20 cents, you know? Yeah, it does cost money. Yes, we do need to prioritize. But let's think through this. The biblical grid we've been working through, whether it be 1 Corinthians 6, our body being the temple of the Holy Spirit, bodily exercise profits little, but it does profit. When we understand that we're our brother's keeper, we spend a little time tonight in Titus 2 about the older teaching the younger. Yes, we teach the truth, but how about where it connects to order and structure and discipline, say, in the home? Are we training up the next generation of what is it like to keep a home? The older women teaching the younger gals and the older men teaching the younger men about how to do life, cooking, laundry. Where's our training of the younger and how to maintain a car, not because we, we want to save all the money to get a bigger and better car, but we're stewards. It's God's vehicle, and we want to take care of it. We don't just run the car till the engine blows up when you could change the oil at appointed times. It takes some, pl some planning, some self-control to make that happen. Or how to keep a check register. I remember my dad had hired somebody at one of his businesses, and she just uh, she never uh, did the end of the month uh, reconciliation of the the checkbook. She just figured if I'm getting low, I'll just throw some more money in, and um, you're going to be wasting a lot of money in bank drafts. One of our high school students in our family this year has a class just in life management. How do we manage life to the glory of God, not just in our spiritual disciplines of our daily quiet time, but how we engage all the events of life with this body? Where's the more intentional discipleship? Where's the training and discipline, the older instructing the younger? How to commune with God and how to cook dinner for the family? How to sow? Rather than throw the socks out and just get a new pair, we just got, we got, we're a throwaway society. 
We stress in biblical counseling the need for involvement, for discipleship. It's, it's intentional in the local church. You look at how intentional Paul was. He, he didn't just have a public ministry, but private. He's, he's filled with tears. There's intense concern for the believers. He's in labor, a spirit of gentleness. He's genuinely concerned as a nursing mother tenderly cares for little chicklets. Now, I, under, I recognize that some of the, my thoughts and comments and the implications of discipline here towards the end of the lesson has been towards, say, what we might call wrong foods, fast, our, our fast food generation. What about too much food? You know, the Bible addresses such things. It's sufficient. It answers the questions of life. What about gluttony or other excesses? Our overeating because we're not self-controlled. You get, eat a lot of fat, greasy food, you become a fat, greasy dude. Just check it out. What you sow, you reap. It's not complicated. We make choices. What we sow, we reap. Remember that the benefit of spiritual discipline is unto godliness. How are we handling our time? Are we disciplined with it? How are we handling our, our bodies? How are we handling our finances? How are we handling our temper? Let's just wrap, wrap it up with this illustration. You know, a, a woman may picture herself virtually out of control. She popped a cork today, just yelling and screaming at her children. However, that point was reached not all at once. It came in stages. It worked up to the, pre you know, the pressure cooker. Even at the most spectacular point, it's possible to get control over anger. Much easier to break the earliest link in the chain of events that led to that point. We're talking about self-control in the nitty-gritty, the grime of life and interaction with relationships. When the scriptures speak of self-control, they've got this idea in mind. Proverbs 17, 14. The, the beginning of strife is like letting out water. So abandon the quarrel before it breaks out. Go back to the earlier links that started building the pressure in the relationship. Proverbs 15.1, a gentle answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. We did a couple of week series on Wednesdays. I think it was last winter or something. Uh, are you pouring gasoline on in the marriage or the other relationships? Or are you taking away the, the uh, opportunity? A fool loses his temper, but a wise man holds it back, Proverbs 29, 11. Holding it back is that discipline. So think of re resistance and think of restraint. Matter of fact, mark those words down on your notes. Resistance and restraint. Man is created in the image of God, we are taught. We are not like Fido or any of the other animals. We choose a course of action. Animals without brains respond immediately just by reflex. But man made in God's image is a responsible creature. He's not a victim. We made our bed, we've got to sleep in it. You know, when Jesus was faced with three temptations at the mountain... In each instance, he entered the thought of the wrong action in his mind, but in holiness, what did he do? He rejected it. There's that resistance. Jesus, by breaking the first link, was able to forge a chain of righteousness. Let's follow his model. There's resistance. There is restraint. How does it work? What does it mean in practical context? Let me give you a few more verses. Proverbs ten nineteen, 
when there are, in the multitude of words, sin is not lacking, but he who restrains his lips is what? Is wise. When we talk a lot, there's a lot of sin involved. A wise man's learning about what he says and when he says it. He who restrains his words has knowledge. And he who has a cool spirit is a man of understanding, Proverbs 17, 26. The heart of the righteous ponders how to answer, but the mouth of the wicked pours out evil things. In other words, he's impulsive. He thinks it, he says it. He is not stepping a half a step back to think, really, should I say this and is this the right time? Thought before action or speech is an essential element in this restraint of evil. So we ponder how to answer. Would you pray with me? Father, there's so many ramifications in both the Older Testament and the New about living a wise life of godliness that is tempered by discipline and controlling our passions. Help us to be better stewards of our time, our talents, our resources, harnessing our tempers, harnessing our tongues because your grace fills us and we want to walk with the Spirit. Use us to advance your fame and demonstrate the transformation of your gospel. For we ask it in Jesus' name, amen.